carry on. So this uh, lecture was put together basically for when the TTC is finishing and uh, people had been asking, oh, what do we do when we go home? Like, uh, how do we start teaching? So this, this lecture gives you kind of a bit more practical ideas on how you can be starting, what you should be doing, and also a few um, ideas from our teachers that have come through the ashram. So first, to get started, well, what will you need? Well, generally, you'll need to register your business. So you'll need to get some kind of a business number. You can normally do this online. It's free of cost and you'll get it straight away. Of course, it may vary country to country. Then you might also decide that you need a business name. Now, most yoga teachers don't uh, get a business name until uh, they want to be opening up a yoga studio as such. Um, and then if you do want to have that business name, you'll need to register it. In many countries, you'll have to pay a fee for that, and it will only last for a certain amount of years. Um, after that, you'll again have to extend it and pay a bit more. So that's for the business name. Now, most countries will also need insurance. Many places, if you want to rent a space, you'll need to have insurance for that. If you're going to be um, working in a yoga studio, many times they'll also ask you for your own personal insurance. Um, so you'll need to have public liability insurance and professional indemnity insurance. Um, you can check different insurance companies. There are many different um, packages they put together, especially for yoga teachers these days. And generally, uh, say in the Western world, it will usually cost about $150 a year. Of course, it can vary um, a little bit from that. But uh, it is essential for you to have it because otherwise you won't be allowed to teach uh, in many places at all uh, unless it's from your home. And it's always better to be safe because you never know if there's going to be a problem. And hopefully there would never be a problem from the way that you're teaching. But uh, accidents can also happen. So it's better to have that insurance to cover you. Uh, and it's also helpful to have a case-taking form. So we can give you a case-taking form and then you can edit it uh, according to what you want to put in there. But it's really helpful if you have some information about your student. So you want to have their name, their address, their email. You want to have their occupation so you'll get an idea of um, how physically active they are. If they might be having any problems, like if they're sitting all day in the office, then Probably they're going to have a little bit of neck pain or upper back pain if they're on their feet all day, you know, so those things will all help you to understand how to cater the class better towards them. You also want to have a list of things that they might have. So if they have, um, you know, back pain, neck pain, knee pain, if they have high blood pressure, if they have insomnia, anxiety, depression, there's lots of different things that you can put into the case taking form. And many times if you just ask them, uh, do you have any problems? They go, no, no. But when it's there, written on the form, then they have to tick it. It reminds them, oh yeah, I do have that knee pain. Oh yeah, I can't sleep at night. Oh yes, I do have anxiety. And especially for anxiety and depression, many people are not going to just go and say it straight out to you but they'll tick it. And I find that 50% of students do tick anxiety or depression. So having that understanding will also help you to know what will be really good for them. And it might be that in the class, say you're doing Brahmari and you say, okay, we're going to do Brahmari, the humming bee breath. This is very helpful for sleep problems um, because you know that one or two of them have problems uh, for sleeping. So case taking forms are helpful. Also, because then you'll have them there um, with everything written down. Because when you start having more and more students, it gets very hard to follow who has what problem. So having it all down there will be very, very helpful for you. And the last point here, you can see having a waiver, so you can ask them to sign that. That might be part of your case-taking form uh, or not. And especially in some countries, you might want to be um, having that declaration. Uh, just to protect yourself that little bit more. So where do we want to be teaching? 
So yes, I have yoga studios written there right at the top. And that is the one that people think about straight away. But what if you don't want to work in a yoga studio? What if you don't agree with the way that they're teaching? What if they don't have space available for you to teach there? So there's lots of other options. Um, so community halls, of course, you could rent out um, the hall. You can teach whoever you want, however you want. You know, you have a lot of flexibility in that way. You might decide that you want to teach from home. You might want to teach from other people's homes. Um, you know, you might decide that you're going to be doing private classes. So you go to people's homes for that. Um, you might decide that you're going to teach in your backyard. Or maybe you have a garage that you can kind of turn into a yoga studio. Or maybe you'll build a yoga studio in your home. Um, there's lots of different options there. And that can be especially helpful when you're just starting out. Um, and you just have one person or a handful of people that are coming, you might decide that you're going to teach in the gym. Of course, teaching in a gym, it can be a little different, and the environment especially um, can vary a lot. Some some gyms, of course, will have a special um, room for, for yoga practices, uh, and others will kind of be out there where you can still see all the exercise bikes and the music blaring and stuff like that. So you just see what is uh, available to you. Uh, then we have things like nursing homes and elderly accommodation. So you might decide that you want to be helping the elderly more. So going to nursing homes, teaching some chair yoga or just teaching some relaxation and yoga nidra can be really, really helpful. And looking at elderly accommodation, so that's where the elderly might be living, but they are still fairly healthy in that they have their own independence and they might be actually doing many things. Uh, lots of those uh, people who have retired, they do lots of different um, activities and they may also have a common room where you can run a yoga class. So those people in that accommodation generally can get to the floor and they can, they can do a little bit more practices than those in the nursing home where they might be confined to a chair or just a little bit of things from standing. So those are also good options. And especially because you can do that kind of thing during the day, whereas when you're teaching a regular yoga class, you might find it's mostly in the morning time or the evening time. So it's good to have different options. I've also written hospitals here. You might start teaching uh, to the people working in the hospital, so the nurses or the doctors, you might teach them yoga nidra or relaxation, or you might do a half an hour session. Uh, you might start to specialize and teach um, to certain patients, say the terminally ill, or you might um, be working in the mental health uh, section. So there's lots of options in hospitals and it's growing in the hospitals more and more all over the world. Uh, you might work in one of the community healthcare centres, so you might um, start a class specifically for stress relief or anxiety or depression or back pain. You know, there's lots of options there too, which can be really lovely. You might teach in a community centre, so whether it's offering one of those classes that I just mentioned or something else. Um, you might want to help a particular um, section of the community. Then schools. So you might teach uh, during the school timing. So you might be teaching for the kids. Uh, you might teach before or after school for the kids. Uh, or you might be teaching the teachers um, because they also need yoga. And if you teach the teachers, then they can also implement many of these yoga practices in their regular school day. So that's also a nice option. Uh, you might teach outside. Uh, in a park or at the beach or some other place. Now, depending where you are, you might need to get permission for this. And uh, some some councils will only allow it if it's free. Uh, and others, of course, might allow you to have some kind of donations. But that can be a really nice option too. And then you might uh, run yoga retreats. Now, yoga retreats are becoming more and more popular. So you might arrange the whole thing where you... Uh, arrange the accommodation and the food and you give them all the different practices or you might just be part of a yoga retreat. You might work 
uh, at a yoga retreat or like you see here, the hotels or spas. So they can be good uh, to teach if you want to teach more than just a class. If you want to teach, say, maybe healthy living or something like that, detoxification, maybe weight loss. So you might run a yoga treat. And it might be that you actually take them to different places. So it might not just be near you. You might take them to different places in your country or you might take them uh, to other countries. There's lots of different options. We have a lot of uh, teachers who also bring their students to the ashram so they can experience the yogic lifestyle. Because uh, students who have been coming for quite a long time, they do want to learn a little bit more. They want to experience something deeper than just the regular yoga practices. <clears throat> uh, and then I've already mentioned about hotels and spas. Now you might work in one of these hotels or spas. The only uh, downside for teaching in this way is that people come and go and you don't see any progression. So you might find that you're kind of teaching very similar things and they might only be there for a day or a couple of days or a week. Um, but they can, especially if you want to travel, we have many of our teachers who have worked in different spas, like the chains of spas all over the world, and they move every three months to a different location. So those are some of the options where you might decide to teach. So what to teach? Well, it's always good to start simple. So teaching the basics so that your students will have a really good foundation and they'll also understand the principles of yoga and what yoga really is about. So having relaxation, having slowness, steadiness, having comfort. Um, so moving away from this idea that yoga is about turning yourself into a pretzel. So here, yes, it's definitely good for everyone to learn from the basics. And it's also a revision for you. Because uh, remember, when you started yoga... It wasn't always so easy. You had to start with simple practices and then you slowly build up with them. So it's a good practice for you also to go back to the simple things. Now also try to have a variety of different classes. So as I mentioned previously, moving away from the idea of just teaching a class for, you know, the fit, flexible 20-something year old. You want to be offering classes that are going to help everybody so it might be you know yoga for children for teenagers you might have classes for specific problems like stress or anxiety or back pain or depression you might teach chair yoga you might teach some um, those uh, retirees you might teach corporate yoga there's so many different options of what you can be teaching so think about what you want to be offering as a yoga teacher now, I've already mentioned about starting simple, so things like all those yogic movements that we do. So starting with all of them and building up over a period of time and slowly introducing different types of asanas. Because remember that not everyone is going to be as flexible as you are. And if someone is new to yoga, they're most probably going to be pretty stiff, or pretty tight. So they need simple practices. In fact, everyone needs different types of yogic movements. They can be so helpful. Even if they are flexible, if they want to advance in their practice, if they want to go into more advanced asanas, a lot of those yogic movements are going to help them to achieve it. And then in your class, have variety as well. So you can have some dynamic asanas, you know, some practices that are more of a warm-up, that are more uh, from an exercise way of practicing but then you also should have some asanas that they're holding so that they can really start to understand the deeper aspects of practicing of asana. Now it's become very common to practice asanas in a very dynamic way and that's often what students want because that's all they know. They think of yoga as an exercise but then it's also up to us to teach them that Okay, they can do that, but there are other things that they can do too where they'll also get benefits and they will also progress. So having that balance in the class of having a little bit of dynamic to satisfy what they want um, to have, but then adding extra things in it for what is actually needed for them. 
okay, and what's actually going to be helpful for them. So a bit of both is always good. Uh, and then having some breathing, definitely you want to have some kind of breathing practices in there, but of course you need to start it very simply. You can't just go and teach them 20 minutes of pranayam, they'll run away. You need to start very, very simply because it's very hard for people to focus doing pranayam. Everyone wants to be able to do meditation, but they don't want to do pranayam. And pranayam is that stepping stone to be able to do meditation. So start it slowly and then extend it. And this last point, explaining why we practice yoga. This is also important. So they understand that it's not just an alternative to going swimming or going running, but yoga has so many more benefits and it's so much deeper and explaining how it's going to be helping them, whether it's going to help them with their sleep, whether it's going to help them with their back pain, it's going to help them with their knee pain, it's going to help them to uh, react in a, a less stressful way so they can deal with their anxiety or their depression. So it is really important they understand what yoga is about and how each of the practices you're teaching them, how they can benefit them. So who to teach? Anyone and everyone, okay? Because everyone needs yoga. It's not just those healthy uh, young people that need yoga. In fact, they might need it a little less than someone who is having back pain or someone who is finding it difficult to move. So we need to take away this idea that yoga is for the flexible people and that yoga is only about, you know, touching your toes. We need to change people's perception and um, educate people so they realize how yoga can actually be benefiting them. So that's why I write, teach those who need it. <laughs> so elderly, students, teenagers, stress relief, prenatal classes, postnatal classes, back pain, anxiety, depression, weight loss. There's lots of other options too. So start thinking about what do you want to be doing? What are you particularly interested in? And what kind of people do you really want to be helping? And then looking at, okay, small groups. We can teach small groups. We can do one-on-ones, like private lessons. Private lessons are very common now as well because a lot of people feel uncomfortable going to a yoga class or they feel that they can't keep up with the practices, that it doesn't suit their body. So having private lessons can be helpful especially at the beginning or for somebody who has a lot of different health problems. It might be that you teach groups of friends. Um, you might uh, know someone that, that has been asking you about teaching yoga so you say okay get a, get a few friends together and you'll start teaching them. That's really really common and it's lovely. But basically also just talk to people and see what's needed. Check what's out there at the moment and fill in the gaps. So what kind of things do you want to bring in your class? Well, yoga mats. Now, if you say to all those new students, you need to bring a yoga mat to your class, many of them won't come because they don't want to invest in a yoga mat just to come to the class when they don't even know if they're going to like yoga. So you need to have some mats for yourself. Eventually, when they've been coming for a while, then you can encourage them to get their own yoga mat because you also want to encourage them to have a little bit of home practice too. But you'll need some to start with. And if you don't have yoga mats, you can use a blanket or a towel and everyone has those. So that's about yoga mats. Now here I write tissues. You don't have to have tissues, but... If you're in a class and one person is continuously sniffing, it can be irritating not only for them but also for everybody else. So tissues can be helpful just to show that little bit extra care, you can say. Then you want to make sure you have your lesson plan so, and a notebook and a pen because you may find that you are changing the lesson plan around. You might find that you are adding things to it, like uh, you might have a student who does a variation without you uh, explaining it and you've learned from them so you've written it down. You learn a lot from your students so it's important to have that 
and especially if you're changing your lesson around a little bit uh, and you might change it because uh, the people who came uh, may maybe they had some problems and they couldn't do certain practices so you changed it maybe you were planning to have a very energetic class but they're very tired so you change it it's fine to change it but you want to make sure that you're writing it down because if you don't write it down the next week you've forgotten it so putting notes down whether it's during the shavasana or relaxation you can just quickly jot it down it's really really helpful <laughs> then having a watch so especially if you're going to be getting them to hold positions for a certain period of time a watch is going to be really really helpful um, but if you don't have a watch at least you want to have a clock in the class because you need to know when you're going to be finishing as well because it's important that you do finish on time you definitely don't want to be finishing early because people will be upset by that but also if you finish late people can also be upset because uh, they might have other plans they might have things that they need to be doing so it's important to try to be following time correctly then you might ask them to bring a blanket or a cushion of course it will depend on the individual but also the class if you do a yoga nidra in your class and especially if it's a little cooler weather it can be nice for them to kind of snuggle up under a blanket and also to have a little cushion and you might uh, ask them to bring a cushion if they have pain you know if they have some back pain or some knee pain a cushion can be really helpful for them so you might supply them or you might ask them to bring them if you don't have your own space and you have to bring yoga mats plus blankets plus cushions it's a lot of stuff so that's where it's helpful to ask them to bring their own then looking at music so music is kind of divided usually around 50% of people like to have music and 50% don't and that's normal because we all have different opinions of music we have different musical tastes and uh, some people really really enjoy the music it helps them to relax and for others the music can be distracting so also it's important that if you are going to have music you want to make sure that there's not going to be singing there's not going to be a lot of like drum beat because that's going to take their attention away from the yoga practice <clears throat> so music for the whole class can be a little tough sometimes many people don't like to have music for the whole thing it can be nice to have music at the beginning of the class when people are just settling in it can be nice to have a little bit of quiet music during a relaxation or yoga nidra but you have to experiment and see what works for you it might be that you uh, are musical yourself and you might involve some music into the class too you'll see also I write recordings of yoga nidra so sometimes you might play a yoga nidra instead of conducting it especially if you've got a class that's been going for a long time and they've listened to your voice a lot and they want to hear something different then you can put a recording on and of course you can share um, those recordings to them as well then you might give handouts and yes you can email handouts to them you can email them information but honestly most people don't look at that kind of thing if it's printed and put in front of them then there's a higher chance that they will uh, practice themselves you definitely want to encourage it because we know that yoga practice should be more than once in a week it should be a daily practice and if we're doing it at home it's much more personal practice than it is when we come to a class it's much more introverting it's much deeper uh, so encouraging that is definitely going to be helpful and especially if someone has a lot of problems like they're having a lot of back pain or they're having a lot of anxiety then a home practice will really really benefit them but you also want to make sure that you're teaching in such a way that they can practice these things very safely and they're not going to injure themselves you might have some kind of recordings as well now I write CD but hardly anyone uses CDs anymore um, and even USBs are slowly going out but you might have recordings of your practice you might have videos you might have YouTube videos you might have audio recordings so those kind of things you can be sharing as well 
Now, also at the bottom, I have some optional things like a timer. So a timer we use like a metronome, which can be helpful for pronoun. Um, these days, of course, um, you get this metronome function on phones. So most people use that. Um, I've written here incense and essential oils, remembering that for many people these days, especially for incense, it can make them cough and certain scents can be a problem for some people. So you have to think about whether you want to have incense or not. Essential oils too, like there are some essential oils that are most commonly liked. You know, things like the citrus oils and lavender, but some oils can definitely bring up a reaction in certain people. So that's where you might discuss it with them and see what they're comfortable with. And then you see the last point, a heater or a fan. So you might need to bring these things according to where you're teaching. If you're renting out a hall and it's really, really hot in there and you don't want to be doing hot yoga, then you need a fan. And same if it's if it's really cold and the heating isn't very good there, you might need to have some kind of heating. Um, especially if you're renting it for only one hour or two hours and it takes like half an hour to heat up the space, you might need that additional heating because you also don't want to be cold when you're practicing. And especially if you're going to be doing relaxation, you're going to be doing yoga nidra and they're laying down, they don't want to be cold. So you might need to have those things depending on where, where you teach. Then looking at marketing, and I'm sure many of you are much better at marketing than me, so this is just some ideas that you can start thinking about. And of course, things are continuously changing. <laughs> so for example, posters on notice boards, if you've got community notice boards around, then that can be helpful. You also have to think about who you're aiming for. Because um, some people don't look at notice boards at all, don't look at newspapers, any of that. They only look at social media. And others do still look at things like notice boards, you know, outside supermarkets, um, put on the walls. Um, a lot of people still do look at those things. Some people look at newspapers. Uh, of course, a lot of newspapers have stopped these days. But especially if you want to be catering to seniors um, or those in the elderly accommodation, you might decide to um, put something in the newspaper. Uh, you might go for social media. You most probably will because that's the most common um, form of marketing these days. And there's lots of different platforms for that. Word of mouth, of course, is still important. And more than half of the students that come to Yoga Point have come because of word of mouth. In fact, probably 80% have come because of word of mouth. So word of mouth is always going to be there. You might have your own website. Um, you might put your information in a newsletter. Um, you might put information in the yellow pages if there's anything like that in your country or other kinds of directories. You might write articles um, about yoga. It might be articles that go in the newspaper or it might be on social media. Um, it might be about, say, yoga, how yoga can help a certain type of person, like it can help you to go to sleep or it might help you to deal with your anger or your anxiety. So there's lots of things that you can write about uh, for yoga. And if you write articles like this, especially if they're going in, say, a normal newspaper, a lot of people will read it who wouldn't normally read anything about yoga, who have never done yoga, but they go, oh, okay. Maybe yoga actually could be for me. Maybe I do suit yoga. So writing those articles can really help change those uh, preconceptions we have about what yoga is. Then, of course, with recordings, um, audio recordings, and now all those YouTube videos can be a really good way of marketing. Uh, then teaching free classes and donation-based classes. So especially when you're really new to teaching, that can be a way to build up your student base um, and it is always nice to have some donation based classes as well just to help those people who couldn't afford to do the class otherwise so when you are um, teaching regularly it is nice to have that that discounted class or to be able to give options for certain people who are struggling uh, of course remembering that you still need to eat as well <laughs> so it's all about the balance 
And yeah, here you can see some examples of offers like bring a friend for half price, discount book bookings in term blocks. That's helpful for them and it's also helpful for you because if someone is committing to say one month with you or a term with you, then you, you know that they'll be coming and uh, they've also given you the money for that and they've made that commitment to them too. So that's just a few options. And now when I put this lecture together, I thought I'm going to ask some of our teachers, what are their tips for all the new teachers that are coming out of a teacher training course and they want to start? So I'm just going to go through these uh, briefly, not in too much detail. Uh, dive straight into teaching. This is actually really important because a lot of people say, oh, I'm not going to start teaching yet. First, I need to work on my personal practice and then I'll start teaching. But you know, it doesn't happen. If you start teaching straight away, your personal practice is also going to be improving. And you're never going to be perfect at everything. And you don't need to be perfect at everything because you already know so many things that are going to help others. So start. <laughs> Being confident, but not too confident. Okay. Um, having faith in what you're teaching, but don't think that you know everything because there's always more that you can learn. Every student is actually your teacher. This is also true. And every class that you teach, you're going to be learning something. I remember my first class that I ever taught and I was so nervous about doing it. And after that hour and a half, I was like, oh, wow, I learned so many things uh, in it. So, yes, you learn a lot from your teaching and your students. Making a plan before the class, keeping the plan and clock on the floor by the mat. Uh, yoga through the class, it helped to keep the rhythm correct and understand the flow and the breath. So yes, you do want to have a plan. Now some people say, oh, I don't, I don't have a lesson plan, I just go intuitively. And yes, that can be good to a certain extent, but then what can happen is the classes can become very similar. And often you forget certain practices that you want to teach them. So it is very helpful to have a lesson plan. Yes, you have to be fluid with it. You have to be flexible, but it definitely helps, especially if you want to be covering certain asanas and, you know, certain poses that you might not naturally do a lot of in your personal practice so you don't think about, um, but you also know that it will be good for them to do. So, yeah, having that lesson plan. Start teaching and you will learn so much more from your students. Yes, we've talked on that. Keep practicing, keep teaching, keep spreading out what you believe and love. And yeah, that's important. If you love yoga, then you want to share it. Why do we want to keep that knowledge only for ourselves? Breathe. <laughs> this is important too. This is important for the teacher, especially when you're new and you might feel a little bit nervous it's just important to remember your breath. And that also links into the next one. Remember, it's not about you. You know, it's also about sharing with your students. A lot of the time, the students will never know that you're feeling nervous. And if you just take a breath, it's all okay. Um, even if, you know, you've forgotten what you were doing, you've forgotten the name of the asana, you've forgotten if you were saying inhalation or exhalation, just take a breath and... Everything will work itself out. Breathe, relax, smile, come from your heart, create a balanced practice, be safe, keep an eye on everyone, giving appropriate safety warnings. Know what you are teaching very well and do your practice every day. Get into alignment with yourself first. Humor is great. Let go of spiritual ego and be an example of peaceful awareness. All of that is going to be really helpful for you. It is important that when you are going to be teaching a class, now just because you're a yoga teacher doesn't mean that your life is perfect and you don't have any stress. Still things can be happening in your life so it's really important that you um, focus and you get yourself ready for the class and anything that is disturbing you, you have to let it go because you don't want to bring that into the class. So making sure everything is clear and ready to teach. So that might be where you spend five minutes in meditation. It might be where you chant, say, 11 ohms before the class, something that centers you and makes you feel 
focused and balanced. Volunteer to teach anywhere and everywhere you can. Get that experience under your belt, definitely. The more you teach, the more confident you will become. And it's really nice to, to volunteer in different places too. And especially if you hadn't really got any experience with teaching certain types of people, you might start with volunteering and then after that you might start a regular class. I know that's how I started with teaching kids yoga. I just started volunteering and then it just became uh, normal <laughs> and uh, great too. Uh, teach friends and family. They love you and support you. This is true and uh, it's always nice to teach friends and family. The only thing is sometimes they're happy to do it. Many times they're happy and they want to learn but not everybody does. And you also need to accept that, um, that yoga is not always the path for them at this moment. They may come to it later on, but you also can't push people into doing yoga. <clears throat> Keep on studying, always smile. Yet yeah, we always have to be studying. Um, there's always more to learn. Practice what you preach. You can't go and tell them to do all these things if you're not doing them yourself. Always be prepared to learn and keep learning. Being a teacher doesn't mean you know everything. Teach what you know and teach it well. Aim for results, but simplify it. It's not the name of an asana that is important, but how it's done and the options and progressions and alignment. Okay. I think that's, you understand that already. Start doing your daily practice of self-study and full devotion, bhakti, developing awareness of your body, mind and spirit. Respect your body, don't push yourself and your prana will increase with the natural flow. Discovering your inner guru, you'll be a great teacher, remembering the traditional yoga, respecting and surrendering to guru. So that guru is also you, <laughs> as Raquel is saying. So following your intuition is also really important. The best teachers are your students. Yes, we learn from our students, as we've mentioned. Be a teacher and a student at the same time. Yeah, we have to always be learning and we should always be at that level too. We shouldn't have this big ego, oh, I'm the yoga teacher and you're my students because, as I've been saying, you learn from them as well. And think of it like a, a relationship of a friend. You're just somebody who knows something that is sharing with them and hopefully helping. It's the beginning of an amazing journey. Teach from the heart, from a position of truth. Ask lots of questions. Admit what you don't know. Keep trying other teachers' classes and always have a beginner's mind. Feel grateful to be on this path. Having the beginner's mind is really important because a lot of uh, yoga teachers start thinking that they know everything uh, when there's always more to learn and there's always different perspectives. So it is really important to keep yourself open start teaching <laughs> like we said at the beginning just start teaching and everything will come to you don't keep putting it off tune in with a mantra before teaching connect with the lineage of great yogi masters trust that you are not alone yoga is a feeling of connection and union with a shared universal energy when you're up there at the top of the class you're on the shoulders of all the masters that have gone before you that is also true so it is important that you uh, understand where yoga is coming from and you feel connected to that. And having a mantra, especially beforehand, will strengthen that connection. Trust your intuition and don't just memorize a script. Tailor each class to how you feel and how the class is and practice from the heart. Your clients or students will pick up on that. It is really important that you're not just saying things because you think that they should be said. You really need to be observing the class and saying things when they're actually necessary. There shouldn't be a script to a yoga class because things are going to be changing all the time. And you don't want to just talk just because it's silent. Uh, make sure that every word you say is actually going to be helpful. Always remember you're always a student before you're a teacher. Don't let your ego get you. Very true. Be yourself. Find your own voice and teach what you're passionate about. Most important, practice for yourself. This is also something important about finding your voice and your way of teaching because we all have our own way of teaching. Um, we have our different personalities. We have our different experiences. So we're not going to be teaching 
exactly the same as somebody else and we shouldn't be teaching exactly the same because we are our own individual so you can teach the way that you feel most comfortable with and what you believe in is really important oh and that moves to the next point teach what you believe in and practice yourself smile smile as you practice keep taking beginners classes and never stop learning the basics start teaching Okay, our Guru Vishwas Mandek told us as he gave us our certificate, it's our duty to go into the world and teach people so they can become healthy. Teach in your community, teach your family members, teach someone with the spirit of Kami Yoga. Studios, etc. can come later and be sure to recite one mantra and two types of pranayam in class so it's not about getting fit with asana. As we all know, asanas are 1% of yoga. Yes, so... Over time, you want to try to have a really good balance in your class. Now, I've mentioned it. You want to make sure you do do some pranayam. Of course, you don't want to do loads and loads of it. You don't want to just do loads of meditation either. It should be a well-balanced class. And over a period of time, you can add in different aspects into it. Whatever you do, do it from the heart. Very important. Have a trial lesson for teacher and student to understand each other better. So this might be if you're having like personal private classes. Um, keeping up a basic routine in your classes for students to rely on. So knowing that you're going to be starting the class in a particular way. You'll have, you'll have your warm-ups. So Suri Namaskar, certain asanas. Um, so there is a routine. Of course, it is going to be varying a little bit. Uh, depending on the class but some things will be similar and there are certain poses that you will always try to implement uh, in your class because of the benefits like all those regular classic asanas uh, we don't just do them once every six months we do them regularly give homework <laughs> this is very much like a school teacher but it is true that it's helpful if you tell them things that they can do at home because if they start to implement some things then they'll realise how they can benefit. So it might be that you say to them, oh, if you're feeling stressed during the day, just chant three ohms. See how you feel. Oh, okay, your back is hurting. Just do this pose in the night before you go to sleep and see how it is. Don't undercharge yourself. Teach what you love. Maintain your personal practice and keep learning. Practice in joy and have faith that good things will come. Relax and smile. Don't try to, ch to teach, but to share. Enjoy the moment to be yourself. Your students will be good teachers for yourself and then you'll be a good teacher for them too. Oh, and this is a really long one. Don't expect to please anyone coming to your class. Some people will love you and follow you. Others will never show up. Nothing bad, nothing wrong. Never try to please everyone as it's impossible in yoga as in life. This is actually really important because a lot of the time uh, when a teacher is new they can feel worried because someone came to the class and they didn't come again or they weren't very happy with it but you know when we uh, meet somebody sometimes we connect with them straight away sometimes we don't really connect so it's okay if somebody doesn't want to be in our class um, we also have to accept that and sometimes it might just be they really love your class because they really like the sound of your voice and another person they don't like the sound of your voice and there's nothing wrong with that either um like it says you can't make everybody happy and that moves on to the next one students are students they're not our students they may come to our class they might try someone else's class and it's fine don't be jealous if someone will move to some other teachers this is important and i've seen this a lot in the yoga teaching world where people can become very protective of their students and their class but it's actually nice for students to experience other teachers too and we can't be protective of our students because they're their own people they can do whatever they want to do and it might be that they come to your class for a while but then maybe they can't come to it or maybe they just need something different and then they'll come back to it so don't be possessive about students keep following what you believe don't follow trends but keep an open mind and learn as much as you can now the longer you're in the yoga world the more you'll see the different styles of yoga come they become very popular and then they go so there's always this up and down with all the yoga trends so 
It is important just to teach what you believe in. You don't need to just focus on one trendy style of yoga because, as I'm saying, it, it might be trendy for a while, but then it will disappear. So you can teach your, your own way. Don't think that it has to be a certain style. What you learn at a TCC is a blueprint which you have to work on. Adapt your personality without trying to become like your favourite teacher. Always be yourself. Now, this is what I've said before. We're all individuals. We all teach in our own different ways. Even if you look at our, our teachers coming through Yoga Point or even the, the ones teaching in the ashram, we all have our, our ways of teaching. Okay, many things are going to be similar, but then we have our own, our own ways too. Never talking bad about other teachers or styles. Whenever anyone asks about our styles, better encourage them to try firsthand and have their own opinion. Yeah. And people will also, also ask you, what do you teach? What style of yoga do you teach? Because this seems to be the popular thing to ask. You can say traditional yoga. You can say hatha yoga. You know, uh, you can say ashtanga yoga, but now ashtanga yoga is always mixed up with ashtanga vinyasa. So it's nice just to say traditional yoga. And um, especially if you're outside of uh, India, you can say that you're teaching the traditional yoga as practiced in India. Um, so, yeah, learn from students. They're the ones making us teachers. Without them, we'd be a bunch of unemployed certified yoga practitioners. Okay, yes, you're going to be learning from them anyway. <laughs> And just a few more tips to think about. So connecting with the yoga community. So you can build that yoga community. Now where you are, there might not be any other yoga teachers, or there may be loads and loads and loads, but you can connect people together. It might be that you try to connect with all the other yoga teachers. And that's actually really helpful. Don't think of them as competition. Think of them as others who you might be able to collaborate, collaborate with. You might be able to do yoga retreats with. You might be able to do yoga workshops with. You might decide you want to come and stay in the ashram for a month and you need someone to teach your classes. So there's lots of benefits of building connections between other yoga teachers. And it might be that you decide that, okay, once in a month, I'm going to do like a haven and maybe some bhajans or maybe some like yogic food, just like a get together. So that can be also really nice to, to build the community. Then also thinking about who you want to attract. Um, what are you hoping to do by teaching? So thinking about the kind of classes you want to be teaching and definitely the universe can help there. And remembering why you wanted to be a yoga teacher in the first place is really, really important. That will give you motivation and it will also give you faith in the way you practice and the way you teach. So hopefully this is going to give you some more ideas and motivation for your teaching journey. Hurry on.